screen. Mm. Oh, you know, your thin yard. Oh, yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, that. Right, yeah, yeah, we're not talking about that. That's it, it's off to me. Yeah. I've <coughs> got quite a few new pictures, yeah. Um, uh, so I'm just saying that. Is that one of them? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, I think everybody has a reason. That was in the, that was in the, 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 the uh, mess when the people of the pictures of the Blackie's got that I've got coming is the one which you might remember where you've got a light, uh, Bob Lightfoot and I think an F1 coming very, very low and there's a yeah. GCA hut, you know, red and white right. checkers yep. and it's coming, you can just see it coming, you know, and, and it's at the level of the GCA hut and, and it's an incredibly impressive mm -hmm. shot. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, if you could, if you could sort of try to sell something like that, that would sell like yeah, hot yeah, it's, it's, in, it's in the book. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the books that we tried to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're going, to put it, we're going to put it on top. Welcome again. I, I, uh, this is, um, again, uh, we've been very, very fortunate in the last few years to have had a series of uh, lightning pilots come and chat to us. And uh, we um, have been very fortunate this time to get Alan Page. Uh, some of you will know him by his... his uh, a, a, what, what kind of name was it? Just your, Porky. Yeah, but, but was it was it your, your code name or what did they call That's it? What everyone calls me. Yeah, Porky Page. Uh, in all the all the books, that's what it's down as. Although he's plainly far from Porky. Um, and uh, Alan would like a, a. In the past, we've had sort of formal lectures, and we've had some where where um, it was less formal. A, Alan's preferred format for this is simply to a, answer questions. A, and let it sort of develop and just go with the flow, as it were. Um, it, it's uh, the sort of thing where, you know, when we're chatting on the phone, I've spoken to him on the phone, and after about an hour, he said to me, um, well, I don't know what I'll talk about. And I've said, well, we have just been talking since quarter to eight, and uh, we've been talking about lightnings, and it's all been jolly interesting, and that's exactly what we want. So um, I don't know if you want to have a little so introductory chat a about preamble. A little introductory preamble, and then basically throw it open. And if anybody has any questions at all, and I'd, I'd like you just to try to develop it, but in the way we do in the review, you know, some this is the kind of format for just now, and I hope it goes well. And ask you all to, uh, if there's anything you ever wanted to know about lightnings and lighting operations, now is your opportunity. Thanks very much, Paul Keith. Charles, the floor is yours. Hi everyone. Right. Just give you a little bit of background first. Okay. So Charles has been trying to badger me into this for years, and eventually succeeded. I think wore me down. Um, <laughs> Basically, give you a bit of background. I went through flying training between 75 and 78, and uh, I started on the University Air Squadron. I got a cadetship while I was there. I left university, went through flying training at uh, Cranwell on a JP5, and then Valley on the Hawk, and then out to Broadly for tank weapons on the Hawk. So I came here right at the end of 80, and uh, started my course in uh, Jan 81. Uh, did four years on a level squadron. Then went to the training flight uh, in about, it must have been March or April 85. Did a year on the training flight as a taxi instructor and as an instrument rate examiner. And then I went to a fire squadron for 18 months and watched that wind down. I was there on the last day. Uh, and then I thought I was going to go to the uh, Missile City. There was only place left to go, going sort of right to left along the flight line. It was just Missile City. I was going to drop off the end of the world. But luckily for me, I decided I would go to the, back to 11 squadron instead. So I went back to 11 and I was there on the last day. And then I sort of uh, shut the hangar doors and threw away the keys, walked down the mess, picked up my bag and went home. And that was about it, I left the Air Force then. Um, sort of almost by design, it sort of worked out rather well. Uh, and then I went to Air Europe, and I had 18 months with Air Europe flying a 757. And I joined British Airways in Jan 90, initially flying the 747-100 and 200, and now I'm on the 747-400 worldwide, out of Heathrow and Gatwick. So that's me. Um, 
what I, as Charles said, what I'm going to do is I'll, I made a little list of a few things. Like this last night, I mean, I could stand here and talk for an hour, but I'm, I find myself incredibly boring, and I don't use them. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, basically, what I'll say, I think there's a little intro. I mean, you, you probably know more about the aeroplane and the history of the aircraft than I do, quite frankly. Um, all I'll say to you is that the aircraft, basically, its role, as you probably all know, changed hugely from the 60s up until the late 80s when we left. And even in the time when I was here, from the beginning of 80, up to 88, we had a huge changeover in the role of the aircraft, the type of flying we did. When I started here, a lot of our flying was flying around at medium level, which for us was sort of 20 to 40,000 feet, boring holes in the sky, flying around, not really being fighter pilots, all head down, in the radar, a lot of that sort of stuff. And we also did low levels as well. We did supersonics, we did high flyers, and we did a lot of head down sort of radar work. A lot of it designed for either shooting people down or weather, or for our quick reaction alert, that's QRA, for our QRA operations, where we'd be sitting in the queue shed at the end of the runway. And I did about 250 days, I reckon, in the queue shed at the end of the runway. Yeah, it was real excitement. <laughs> about five, five sort of days of excitement and 245 total boredom watching awful videos that the crowd got hold of. And I won't go any more into that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at the very when you get a sixth one of the day, believe me. Um, so, that, that's really how we started. We do a very small amount of what we call sort of visual tactical stuff, like uh, the low level affiliation stuff and, and the air combat side, which a lot of you read about and, and write about and all the rest of it. We didn't do a huge amount of that. We did the odd bit, mainly, I think, uh, because of the fatigue situation with the aeroplanes. The Mark VI was very heavily fatigued at the time. It was supposed to go out of service in 76, then 81, then 86, and eventually 88. So the aeroplanes were pretty fatigued out. So we were very limited in what we could do in the sixes. Whereas the fires and threes, the threes have been in storage for a lot of years and they've gone out of storage again, so they had masses of fatigue on them. We'd literally pull the wings on every day if we wanted to. Uh, and the fires had even more. So uh, we had to limit our, all our visual stuff really to fly on the fires and threes, which limited us hugely on range uh, and hugely on really the amount we could do, because we only had three, three, uh, three threes and one fire on the squadron. So it's unlikely to have more than a pair, say, serviceable at any one time. But as the 80s went on, you know, gradually more and more into the visual stuff. Um, obviously the UK's, uh, the air defence role in the UK went very much from a high level bombing type scenario to a low level threat. So similarly our role changed as well and what, what changed it probably more than anything else was when the Phantom came into service. When the F4 came along um, and moved from ground attack into air defence in the mid 70s, whenever it was about 76 I think they, they replaced the line in Germany, 75, 76. Um, when that happened, they suddenly had an aeroplane that, that could work completely autonomously without any, any sort of ground control or anything. They could set themselves up on a camp over the North Sea somewhere, wherever they were, over land, set themselves up. They had the pulse doppler radar, so it worked over land. They had a pretty good range. It was pretty early day stuff, but it worked pretty well. They had an all-weather missile, which we didn't have. And so they then redesigned the whole of UK air defence around the F4. Uh, so that the aeroplane could just go off an exercise, put itself over the North Sea at 6,000 feet, which is a normal cat line, and pick up its own targets and work out its own intercepts. Um, fortunately or unfortunately for us, they then decided, well, you know, we should all fly the same syllabus. So that's what happened. So we ended up really in a situation where we were flying an aeroplane that, quite honestly, certainly wasn't designed for it, and really wasn't suited to it, flying almost autonomous operations at times in the lightning uh, out of the North Sea, which was, which was quite interesting. Um, uh, now, a few subjects, that's a bit of background there, so that's how we ended up doing all the combat and stuff. The other thing is it's very good fun, and so come the last year or two on the squadrons, once they've done the fatigue mods to the aeroplane and we had all this extra fatigue, we thought we might as well use it. And when we actually had an end date, we thought we might as well have some combat, now having not done a lot for years and with fatigue limits on the Mark 6s, so we did loads of it. So we went around in the last probably year and a half, um, we probably did as much or more than they ever did in Germany and uh, in, in, within the same sort of period. So we were doing, you know, combat and load of fulfill all the time and we started to use bigger and bigger formations, fighting bigger and bigger formations and the biggest thing that I ever personally did was on the tactical leadership program course at Yeva, we were flying around 18 ships um, and being attacked by 8 ships and things, flying fighter escort and fighter sweep and all this sort of stuff. So um, I can talk about that. So I've written down a few things. Okay, well the course was run, it was a, it was a NATO course run for all the NATO nations um, and the course was set up like war basically. Uh, it's four weeks long, and you turn up, and there were two courses that were run. Uh, the short range course, and the long range course. Um, and, and by short range, I mean range of the aircraft. So needless to say, we were on the short range course, and you know, we could only just about make it to wherever else was going, and I had to come back again. 
So you know, we needed tanking some of the time to go down to South Germany. So um, we're on the short range course, long range course, are airplanes like Buccaneers, Tornadoes, this sort of stuff. They could have iPhone 11s that could actually you know, fly around for four or five hours if they had to. And basically, the setup, you'd have uh, 12 ground attack airplanes, 12 mud movers, and six air defenders. Uh, and you'd go out and fight each day. So each day would be one mission, and you'd go and have war. So you'd start off the course with about, it was about four or five days ground school, so it was about a week of ground school, the first week, where you did a lot of sort of tactical stuff, did a lot of just general info stuff on the threat. And then you'd each give two lectures. Each group of people, each group of pilots would give two lectures. One on the aircraft they were flying, the performance of the aircraft, and one on its weapon system. Which, in the case of the Lightning, the latter didn't take very long. Um, sort of filling it with some of your jokes or something. Um, so you, you'd each give a couple of lectures, so that would go on for a bit. Um, you get through the first week, and then you start setting up the scenarios. And the scenarios started with very simple stuff. So the first three missions were things like just straight low level affiliation like we did in the UK. And they pair you up with one of the mud movers. So on my course, I can get this right. On my course, we had four A-10s who were actually UK based. Um, so obviously American. Two Dutch F-5s, two German Alpha Jets, and four lunatic Belgian Mirage F-5s. <laughs> Mirage and they're completely nutcases. And on the southern car right, that's done by ourselves, by 11 and 5 here, by 29, uh, on Phantoms at Coningsby, and by what well, was 23, and I suppose 56 at, uh, um, at Waddisham, and then became, of course, 23 on the Falklands, and 74 arrived, and all the rest of it. But the Southern Car Radio shared between Waddisham, Coningsby, and ourselves. So we did about 40% of the year, and as I said, 98% of it was absolutely, ugh, it was just complete boredom. And you do 24 hours in the shed, starting at 9 in the morning, finish at 9 the following day, there'll be the two of you, with two fully live armed aeroplanes. So there are two ready use missiles, 240 rounds of high explosive ammunition, um, full war load, fueled up, ready to go, all plugged in, and uh, used to work on a readiness state of 10 minutes to airborne or two minutes from the cockpit to airborne. So, whatever time it was, day or night, if you've got a scramble call, if they were stupid enough to scramble you from bed, which actually happened to me the second day I was in there, you know, it's a sod's law, it's going to happen to me, it's going to burn anyone. Um, that, that's actually what happens, you've got to be airborne in 10 minutes. Um, yeah, there's no reason actually to do that because they've got, only got hours of warning. It's a last minute decision by someone down at High Wickham decides to scramble off, and that's what happens. So, generally, the majority of the scrambles we did were practice scrambles. You know, when someone went in for their first day, we'd do a practice scramble, really, just to let them see what it's like. And you'd go in, when you, when you went up now in the morning, you'd accept the aeroplane, sign for it. The ground crew would take each aeroplane off state for about half an hour during the day and just do a, a quick service on it. Obviously, it didn't need a lot. They check everything over, and you'd actually set the cockpit up for a, for a quick scramble. So you'd leave a lot of things switched on, you wouldn't normally leave on, but because the power was off, it didn't actually matter. But as soon as you'd gone in and hit the gang bar on the right hand side, all the major switches were on the gang bar. So the only thing you actually had to switch on apart from that was the, the gyro, the main gyro, the main attitude indicator, because you couldn't leave that switched on. So um, what you do is hit the gang bar, hit the attitude indicator, strap in. If they'd given you a scramble from the crew room, it was really a case of start one, start two, kind of be down, you're out the door, and you're gone. Um, hopefully within 10 minutes. Um, I got about, I don't know how many scrambles I got from here actually, I've got a few practices, some live ones, I think I did about three or four, probably about three or four live ones, but I got on my second, my second ever day in the queue shed, it was at night of course as well, uh, I was one in the morning, the phone rang, and I was on Miss Vic Allen actually, and we normally had an agreement, a, cha a boys agreement, that if you'd seen a Russian, you'd let the other guy be Q1. So regardless of, um, Regardless of your seniority on the squadron, you know, you could have been on the squadron for 15 years. You know, it could be the boss, it could be anybody. Um, if, you, if you'd actually had a live intercept and got one, you'd let the other guy, who's the most junior pilot of this limited combat ready, QR ready, you'd let him be Q1. So he would get the scrum. However, it didn't always work out like that because the airplane's got to start for you to actually get airborne. So, <laughs> 25 percent of the time, Q1 would leave the thing. Yeah, off! <coughs> we fuck, we fuck! And that's the end of that. And <laughs> You know, sods the law, off goes the other guy, and he gets two bare deltas up in the eyes of the pharaoh's gap. He thinks, I don't believe, I thought another like, ten years. <laughs> you know, that often used to be what happened. We, uh, we didn't have that many, I'm trying to think how many we probably had in a year. They normally gave us scrambles, really, for the hell of it. I've never, I've never known of a scramble that was actually for Southern QRA, because the country's been divided in half. Uh, I've never known of a few scrambled off, say, and sent down to the English Channel. I mean, it just didn't happen. You know, we weren't just there for Russians, we were there for like aircraft that have got lost, airliners that have got lost in distress, anything like that. We used to practice that as well. 
you know, we used to fly sorties. One of the objects all you used to do was a simulated QRA profile. And if you're the target, you could decide what you're going to do. You could go up there and simulate a radio failure by flying triangles. You could do what you like. You could pretend to be an airline and you couldn't be anything. And then the guy had to lead you back. So you get the junior pilot, or whatever it was, to come past and give all the signals and waggle his wings and lead you back and all this stuff. So we used to fly lots of different profiles to try and teach the guys to do this. There's nothing quite like doing it for real. But I, I got this scrambler on my second ever day in the queue shed, half past one in the morning, and the phone rang. And all it was, apparently all they said on the phone, was scrambled. And I was on with Chris Allen. He'd actually got a couple of bare deltas the previous year. And so he said to me, you know, all right, Porky, you're on. You're Q1. I'm like, all right, we're right, on Q1. Second day in the queue shed. Here we go. First day, of course, I'd have a practice just to see what it was like. And got up and just done some, bought some holes in the sky, done some intercepts with someone. And then, you know, and all he did was he answered the phone. I saw both of those two beds there, and I should say we had about six grand crew with us in there as well, um, in, in the other room, a separate room, and a kitchen. And they they cooked for us, which could be a real disaster. There's one or two people who could tell you about that. <laughs> anyway, it was a disaster as the films actually. And the phone rang, and speak out, and he answered the phone, and he just went, "Yeah, right." Put the phone down and ran out the door. And I'm lying there, and said, "What's going on? What's happening?" Subscribe on. And off he went, hits the bell, there's a bell we had, so he hit the bell, <coughs> the bell rings throughout the building. He just he went herring out the door, and I thought, well, I think I'm going to have a wee first, thank you very much. So I did, got in, and it was, as soon as I plugged in, the telebrief's already in the aeroplane, which goes straight to Ops Underground Cables. And as soon as I plugged in, they said, right, you know, this is whatever, whoever it was born with, probably. Um, scramble, 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 and off I went. And I got air, I got everyone out of here, what was it, half past one, twenty two in the morning. As I climbed away, they said, you know, call Midland, which we normally did. And they said, right, the tank is on your nose, range 10 miles, crossing right to left, 15,000 feet, climbing out moral. But what? So within about five minutes of being in bed, or seven minutes, I was actually in behind the tanker. I'm not going to tell you how long it took me to get in, plugged into the tanker, but it was about being Lucas. <laughs> it took a long, I thought I wasn't going to get in, which is probably the worst possible thing that can happen, you know, your first live scramble, your second time in the queue ship. The sort of, I'm used to tank every day almost, so you, it's something you do, you know, you do in your sleep. I think I probably was in my sleep actually, but I could not for the life of me get plugged into this tanker and, uh, and eventually, I don't know, I tried every hose, every direction, backed off for 10 minutes, went back and eventually, I don't know which hose I got in in the end, it was a Victor, pitch black, and, uh, and eventually I got this thing in, and God knows how, but we ended up at 64 degrees north, 10 west, which is a long way north, it's about 500 miles northwest of Lossy now. Um, and they're sitting there saying, you're getting hungry back there, are you? And I said, no, you are starving. He's dying for a piss. Yeah. So, you know, 25,000 feet, going round and round in circles on cat, you know, about a thousand miles from Bimbrook or something. Uh, looking at the sea down there, you know, it's a bit cold down there. If I can catch his fire, I'm going to be swimming a long way home. I don't know walk away from this. And we sat there for five hours. And the bears that were knocking around disappeared, they went low level. And in fact, it was the standard Cuba run they used to do. They used to come round across the top of the Iceland Ferros, got gone down sort of the of the Irish Sea or around the west of Ireland. And they knew they were coming. Some days they knew they were coming exactly what time they were going to be there. But uh, I've heard all sorts of stories of people, you know, bears going over and people chase them at that level and all the rest of it. Um, but this was, you know, this was a normal case. It would often happen. We'd get up there. Of course, it should have been a northern QRA scramble because it was up north of Lucas. But, you know, we hadn't had one for three months or six months. They thought they'd give us a go, you know. But, you know, the boys are going to sit there for weeks on end. We might as well let them have a go. So. Um, so that was it. That's a, that was a pretty typical Q scramble, but uh, I don't know, quite a few people did get QR intercepts out of here. Did you back up on the last week and slightly later? Because we could go to, well, legally, 625, 650, um, but a lot more. Uh, obviously at height, we have the beating of them. So a Harrier is the sort of aeroplane you want to fly high up if you possibly could, given a choice. So fighting a Harrier, low level of field, if you were fighting, you know, when I went out to Germany, did a week, uh, when I was quite young man, actually, I went out and did a week or twelve or ten days at Goodislow, fighting big packages. I exercised out at, at Goodislow, and I was down in Area 3, which is sort of down near Munich with all the hills and, you know, valleys and stuff down there. Really good flying area. Very difficult to pick people up in the Harry, and you know, it was quite a difficult aeroplane to see as well. It's quite small. Um, and, you know, if they're flying an eight ship, uh, and, and they're missile armed as well, you've got a real problem. You know, it's okay if you have to roll in behind the back guy, because he's got no one behind him, five miles behind him. But if, he, if they're flying around you know, in a car formation, which they tend to do, and they're sort of three miles, five miles apart, and they're missile armed, obviously you roll in between the sections of the car, you're going to get you know, blown away before you've got anybody. But once they start turning at low level, they're quite difficult, because they do turn quite well, low down. And they've got the performance, obviously they've got power. But the VIF thing that everybody goes on about, I remember watching on TV during the Falklands War, you know, probably in the mess here, sitting watching it, and seeing this thing on BBC, you know, and they had this, um, 
you know, this Argentine uh, mirage. And here's the, here's the Argentine mirage. He's flying all like that. And there's the Harrier, the Sea Harrier, you know. And they're flying along, and the Sea Harrier goes, woof, woo, ching, bang, dead. And, and they show this little cartoon of this thing doing this. And they, this is what it does. The Harrier is a wonderful airplane. Well, actually, it's a little rubbish. Because um, when he lives, he actually goes plan form. So if you've got a Harrier, it can, it, I tell you, make sure your eyes are <coughs> If you're at sort of almost gun range by an Harry, it's, it's his last ditch maneuver. It's what we call a last ditch maneuver. Because after that, he is going nowhere. He's going to be at 100 knots, sitting duck. And in a multiple environment, you know, someone else, if you don't shoot him because you overshoot, <coughs> someone else will make him him straight away for breakfast. So, I mean, he's, he's absolute sitting duck. Uh, and, and the best thing to do, I always found that if a Harry of this was to go up, okay, if you could, get round him one way or the other, or just go, just go vertical, you know. And as long as you've got above him, you could roll over above him, look down, and there he is. And it doesn't matter which way he's going. It's like sitting on the North Pole. It doesn't matter which way he's going, you're going to shoot him. You're going to be behind him. It doesn't matter which way, any which way. Uh, and I always thought, well, you know, it's a joke. And in fact, when you fought experienced Harrier pilots, they, they never, they didn't biff. They didn't do it. Because all they'll do is wash off, you know, they'll go from 300 knots. And in combat, you know, energy is what it's all about. You want the maximum energy you can have, either by height, by virtue of the height you're at, or by virtue of the speed you've got. Um, so once you're actually in a fight, you want energy. And the last thing you want to do in Mugger's game is to chuck energy away. Now, if you're fighting, let's say, I mean, very unrealistic, but in training, if you're fighting 1v1 against another aeroplane, so you know the threat is just one other aeroplane, you might, you know, to get the kill, to, to beat him, you might say, okay, I'm going to throw everything away in one manoeuvre. I'm going to chuck everything away. I'm just going to reef it in like you do a rotor at the end of the runway, you know. You just reef the aeroplane, fly him through you so he can't turn, and then roll him behind him and shoot him. Yeah, fair, oh, yeah good stuff, great. I got the kill. I beat you. Wonderful. In real life, it isn't like that, because someone else is going to come out and shoot you. So the last thing you're ever going to do in combat is throw away energy. You know, it's darned. And if, you, know, it's only, you only see the very inexperienced guys in areas chucking energy away. Once you've started fighting multiple combats, it's darned, because they just get shot. You know, it's stupid, just sitting down. Just fix the boom, and then they used to get this bit of hose, 12 feet of hose, with two universal joints, one on either end, and they'd attach this to the end of the boom. So what you're going to have in flight is the aeroplane final one, with the boom attached to the aircraft, and then the universal joint, 12 feet of hose, and a universal joint, and a basket. And we had to all get qualified on this blooming thing. And I'm, at the time, I'd only done about, I don't know, I'd done about a year on the squadron. And uh, so it decided, right, everyone at Binbrook, or those that weren't 135 qualified, we'd all go and get qualified. So we had pairs going, I think 12, was it? Oh, more than 12, actually. I think there's 12 on our squadron. I think there had 20 aeroplanes going on this 135 in the space of about two hours. We had a slot out on Area 5 up on the North Sea, about 100 miles from here. So we're northeast 100 miles. And we all went up there, and I was first up, you know. So I thought, this is great, you know. I had all these stories. People had come back with the whole refueling boot missing, <laughs> ripped off by 135. Probe, probes left in baskets, baskets ripped off, the whole hose ripped off the back of the 135. I mean, these stories are bound. It was, it was bloody difficult. I think if I had a go at it a few years later, with a bit more experience, I probably would have found it a little bit easier. But it, it was not easy. Tony Paxton was in the back of it as well, taking pictures. He went up, went out of the room, got a ride with him, sat in a boom position, killing himself laughing. Because he'd done it, so he'd have to get qualified. But you used to have to come up right behind this thing. And whereas our, 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 our hoses would just sit nice and steady, they were really good. Um, this thing moves around quite a bit. You'd have to sit about a foot, two feet behind it. And you had to go in two feet, right two feet, up two feet. <laughs> Literally, like that. And the hose would bend and make a big U bend. So you'd sit there with this, with the, with the boom, you could just see the, the probe here, with the, the probe sticking out, the basket on the end, and a big U, and then the boom next to it. And the idea was to get it just right, this nice U-shaped link, so it had two universal joints, they both went like that, and, it, and the fuel flew, flowed. Flew. <coughs> now, if it didn't do that, what it would quite often do is, well, A, you wouldn't get in. Uh, and you, a lot of people, I mean, the first, I don't know, first 20 stabs I don't know, I nearly came straight out again, because I was afraid of ripping the probe off. Um, because the probe had all these weak things around it anyway, so that if you put a side force on it, it would rip it off. So the last thing we do is leave it off, because the chance is you leave it in the basket. We, got, we spent months trying to get this 135, but they didn't want to leave 19 guys with no refueling, because I'd left mine in there. But eventually I did get this thing in. And uh, what it would sometimes do, if it went a bit wrong, and you got a bit far away, is the, the, the big loop would just go whiz around a couple of times. And do a couple of quick, and off would go the probe, you know. So but they were really difficult to open the tank off. So when we did this QRA back in about 82 or 83, during the Falklands War, we were all dreading it. The thought of night tanking, this was by day, the thought of actually going up at night in cloud on a 135, you know, oh, it doesn't bear even thinking about. Um, our own tankers were all very straightforward, really. I mean, I learned on Victors, like most people did. So, I mean, it's very straightforward. Different people use different ways of doing it. When you first start, you line it up with one of the lines, 
Uh, no, you, the fact you use the ailerons, I used to use the ailerons trim tab when I first started. You know, the left ailerons, I think, had a little trim tab on it on the ailerons. If you line up exactly on that and ran the hose down the DI that was on top of the cone, you think everything just goes straight in every single time. Just ignore the boss, it just goes straight in every time, over on a coconut. But after a while, you sort of got the hang of that and you start watching the baskets. I used to think, well, how close can I get up? And you just rattle it around, just put it back, and just dig it in. Get all the clever stuff going. The, um, the Vulcan was quite interesting because, again, that was a centre hose. That's where I lost my only pro tips on a Vulcan because the hose wasn't primed. And if the hose sat much higher than the Victor centre hose um, ever did because the bar this, this big box was right on the back of it between the engines. So you've got these four bloody red engines. And this, this hose coming at the back, you sit there with your fin in, actually in the jet wash. So you're sitting there with the rudders tramping like and the aeroplane shaking. And we, we put down all the fin, all the fins we had in about 86, 87 to that, which John Spencer did, because we actually thought it was down there, combat, all the combat we were doing, but we didn't want to tell them that, because they'd stop us doing it. So it was down to the Vulcan tank, there's definitely these rivets coming out. And the Air Force believed us. Whether it was or not, I have no earthly idea. But that's the story in the sticky book. Um, but anyway, the Vulcan was, was, uh, it was okay. Uh, you know, it just had the one centre hose. Apart from that and the turbulence, it was okay, but what, what happened sometimes was the hose wasn't primed. The first time I ever tanked on one, if the hose wasn't primed with fuel, it was light. You couldn't tell, it was hung normally. And when you hit it, of course, this great ripple goes straight up at it to the end, comes back in, and you go, oh no! <laughs> like, and there goes the protein. <laughs> left it in the basket, so it's sitting there hanging out in the basket, and oh dear, I've got a hole in my refueling probe, and there's my protein sitting in the basket, no one else can go tanking. Which is, and the guys don't like it either, the tanker drivers, if they've got. If you're first up and they're sitting there with full fuel, they can't go anywhere. They've got the hose stuck out, they've got your pro tip in it, they've got nothing. You know, They're not allowed to jettison fuel unless they've got an emergency. And they're sitting there for hours on end, not being able to give any away. So, the VC-10, the airplane I find out, the 747, again, you know, the wings are up above the fuse launch in flight. They're way up above the fuse launch. As the airplane lifts off, they go like this. There's a plant hands you watch one from behind. And uh, the VC-10 is like that. And the first few times I went on the tower, I thought, this is weird. You know, why do I keep turning side? I end up like this, flying along like this. Lining up the wings. The obvious thing to do is line the wing up across the, the windscreen, and you're sitting there, and you suddenly look at the attitude, and I've got 10 degrees of bank on. Why is that? And you've got a bit of rudder here, and a bit of that there. <laughs> Everything's cross control. Like, it's very difficult, this aeroplane. Can't cope with this at all. I don't know. I was finding it so easy. The other thing is, you've got some really weird vortices off it. The ailerons, like the Victor, they, they, they have the ailerons sort of up float in flight disabled fatigue. As you went one side of the aileron hinge or the other, the aeroplane would change its trim. So normally, before you plugged in, you'd set the trim on, on the aeroplane for whichever side you're on. So if you're on the left side of the tank, you go half a left rudder, half a left aileron, and just plug it in. And it'd be just about right when you're sitting in, because all the force is off the wing. But with the VC-10, if you had one side of the aileron or the other, looking at it, literally within about six inches, all the trim on the aeroplane would change. It was uh, quite interesting. The centre hose on it was amazing. I, uh, apart from what I said about seeing the fin above your head, I remember on exercise, you know, they had the centre hose out one day, and I just plugged in. I didn't even change the power for about 10 minutes. It literally towed you around the sky. You could just sit there, just part of the power at about what it was, 88% or something like that. And you'd sit there and it just it literally drive you around the sky. It was so phenomenally stable. Um, I never had to go to TriStar. I had to go to the Buccaneer, as I said. I had to go to the Buccaneer, um, which, is, which is very interesting. It's like real close formation, normal fighter close formation, but actually plugged into a hose. And you get some very interesting vortices of the wings. It's quite an unusual angle. It's very highly swept. Um, so that's quite interesting in the tank of as well. Uh, what else? That's probably about it. I don't even know if tanked on. So that's it. There's enough on tanky for you. You bought yeah. with that, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. 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 Talking to an Italian pilot last week, he was trying to wind up by driving on the wrong side of the road. He said, not only do you do that, but also when you're wrong, maybe with a tanker, you're coming on a different side than we do as well. Yeah. So, which is absolutely unbelievable. He said, well, we haven't actually got it together, but we all come on the same well, side. Well, we, we always used to join on the left and leave on the right. <coughs> when I was doing it, we always joined on the left and left on the right. Uh, however, these days, I believe, I'm not sure, I think they join on the right and leave on the left. Which probably is the way that everybody else does it, but it changed. Um, but we used to do, we used to do quite interesting tanking. We used to do, I'm talking about tanking, it's reminding me of something. We used to do night, you know, night lights and all sorts of stuff on our normal training. But things like some of the exercises, like Coffee Charming, which is the night ECM exercise. All this jamming going on the radio, there'd be lots of spokes on the radar. You just go off to your, your bit of sky, your camp. There'd be all these, it could be anything, it could be Falcon 20s from... Norway could be our canvas, our ECM canvas could be F 111s at low level at 5,000 feet. And you have certain sanctuary heights you fly, but you also have the tankers up there. So, you not only that, you've got lightnings up there, phantoms on our side, you've got friendly stuff, you've got our friendly tankers, you've got all these other aeroplanes milling around the North Sea, 
You can't hear anything on the radio because you're being jammed down by Queen or whatever they put on, you know. <laughs> Flash! Oh, I think I'll go on. What's worse than that is they used to record what you said and play it back to you 20 minutes later. And that was very clever. And they've caught a, a lot of people out by our cameras, used to sit with a tape recorder. And they, re they record the controller. So you say, you know, 2 1, vector 0 4 0, target low level, 30 miles, high speed, heading, whatever. And they record this, and then 30 minutes later they say, you know, mission 35, vector 0 2 0, and they go, like, go right, he's off. <laughs> and he's zoomed off into the boondock somewhere over the North Sea. And they haven't given him that at all, they're just playing back the tape again and again. Uh, but one thing we used to do on that was we used to do silent tanking, and that's one of the reasons, one of the only times we sort of operation in silent tanking. You know, obviously, in the wartime, you might have to do it. But we used to silent tank on that, so you'd have to, in the middle of all this melee of aeroplanes all over the sky, and I've had a lot of very near mid airs doing coffee chinese. Um, you know, you'd be flying around and look around, so there's the belly of the camera up above you or something, I mean, it was amazing. So we had what we called a sanctuary at 2,000 feet, it was normally sort of 14 to 16,000 feet, so based around 15, 15 and 25. And those would be our sanctuaries, probably five as well, where we could go, and there'd only be friendly forces in there. So we know the cameras wouldn't be there, the 111s wouldn't be there, well, whoever else was out jamming that day wouldn't be in there. So you're only going to worry about is you make it to you, you know, which I'm not sure is better or worse. <laughs> but uh, depends who it is. But I mean, there'll be all of you in there, and what you'd have to do then is find the tanker, get there without really hitting anybody, nip up behind the tanker, two miles behind him, 2,000 feet below, slide up to him. And I've actually been sitting two miles in a waiting position. If you had two guys on the wing, you had to wait behind him. And I've actually been on a coffee jar, I sitting there, 2,000 feet behind the tanker, and a phantom's coming belly up to me, straight across the front of me, rolled out that wall. Right in guns running, 200 yards in front of me, I was sitting in the two seat of a field grass, and we just sitting there watching, and I like, oh, that's good. <laughs> you know, he didn't look very well, did he? And he's like a navigator looking for him as well. So it's like a lot of things, you know, like doing combat with your belly check. When you join the tanker, especially silent, you have a really good look who's in behind, who's joining, who's leaving, and use the radar to sort of, your, your brain sort of gets to work off for a while, after a few years, to, to look at the picture and try and analyse who's where, where they're going, what heading they're on, what's happening in behind and leaving. And you'd be very careful about how you came in two miles an hour, especially silent, without any control. And you come up on the left wing, he'd turn some lights off to let you know you're clearing behind, you go in behind, he'd give you a green light, you go and plug, he'd flash the green to say you can stay in or you can leave, because we always stayed until we get the maximum fuel, which didn't last very long anyway. And then he'd put an amber on to say, okay, you're clear to disconnect, you disconnect, you go to the right side, then you nip off. And on a coffee chart, which might last two or three hours, you'd be doing that several times during the night. So you know, we used to do it silent as well in all sorts of conditions. So. I'll tell you something funny actually, the, um, I think it's funny. You know, I never used to, I could never work this out. I used to sit in behind, so many times I've sat behind victors and things. I thought, what on earth is he doing? What is going on? He's all over the sky, this bloke, you know. He's shaking about all over the place, the basket's everywhere, the an aeroplane shaking up and down. What is going on? I must have an absolutely crappy autopilot. I don't understand it, you know. What he's got to do is hold the aeroplane straight up. It's not difficult, is it? I can never understand this until I started flying airlines. Suddenly I encountered clear air turbulence. I thought, oh, it's bumpy up there, isn't it? <laughs> so I never knew it was bumpy. The lightning's such a high wing loader, I never, knew, never encountered any clear air turbulence. It's by a long, nothing at all, no bumps. And not, only if you do some of the jet washes, they don't tell me if you any. And so we'd be sitting there, probably that day that I got that scramble from QRA, it might well have been, you know, moderate clear air turbulence all the way to Lucas. I don't know. I still don't know to this day, but it might have been. But I didn't feel anything. I wasn't being bounced around at all. So, you know, so I used to criticise those guys all the time, for God's sake, give it stay! <laughs> and in fact, you know, it might have been a really bumpy day. In which case, why don't they change their height? Well, that's another story. But I didn't know, because I'm just sitting there, it's absolutely beautifully smooth, so I wouldn't know. It's three o'clock, it's now, tar target is to be back down here probably about, if everything goes well, back down here about four o'clock for a bit of a debrief and, uh, you know, fill you in and everything else that's happening, and then off you go home. Safe journey back. See you later, but four o'clock down here. Round on the track, uh, beside the grass there, down to the end, marshal it to the right, go up onto the other part of the runway, come down the runway here, bring it down here, and then do a 360 turn, so a slow 360 turn so you can see it from all angles. So, as far as the safety aspect is concerned, if you stay on the grass, which is up that side of the hangar there, 
or down this side of the building here, back behind about that line, everything will be okay and there won't be any problem with the jet wash. So particularly when it's actually moving, uh, uh, if you could stay at say on the grass to the side of the hangar but without actually going onto the track or in this kind of 30, 40 feet here while it's turning when it comes back. So hopefully it will move a reasonable distance. While it's actually turning, try and keep it behind this light. They'll still, they'll still get a, yeah, they'll still get a fairly, you know, warm draft from the engine as it turns round. But basically, and this is the damn wall we got. Yeah. So, uh, I've got to move it back. I've forgotten. Them.
See you again. Yes, I'll Yeah. Just the time. Roll them out Okay. Yeah, the number one was okay with it. Yeah, she runs nice, I thought that's all we've got. Yeah, she was quite cool. I had about 70 minutes I've got number one. Yeah, we got it. Took it on the set. Five this morning. Yeah. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. Four years ago, we did the aircraft pull. It was a red hot day, and there was a breath of wind. The only problem was that we were doing with a bit of reason. I'll tell Ted I've seen you anyway. He's an absolute maniac in that thing, honestly. He really is. He's a really good pilot. He is very good. He is very good. And they're buying Delphins. He said to me, I'm looking for someone else to sit in the number two, and then we're going to do some formation in this Delphin. And I was saying, saying uh, Ted, you're not serious. Yeah. Said, yeah, 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 we'll teach him. And this, I don't know, we'll find someone else. Then. Getting albatrosses as well, now. Yeah, yeah they are. They've got. Oh, I've seen one. Down, yeah. I've seen it down there. I was down in the summer flying. We did a detachment down there for five weeks. It was five bulldogs, and I went down there, and they were. Uh, the dolphin there is the best display I've seen by a dolphin. Just the next time I saw uh, one, one of Ted's shorts. Oh, one of his. Pilot, yeah, one, one of his dolphins. Yeah, which I says to him. Or oh, was that one of your dolphins? I said, yeah. I said, well, that's the best display I've seen by dolphins yet. I said, you can tell them. You know, I said, try and use the dolphins as low power. Try to keep maximum power on and keep the speed up all the time. You want to do it. Well, that's the safe one as well. Yeah. Speed is groovy. Uh, it's going to get wet. Yeah. Right. Well, on the picture or down here? Well, where you like. So I'll do it down here, rather than down yeah. the picture. Do it down there and on the picture, if you don't mind. Sure? Yeah. <laughs> When was the last time you flew the Lightning? Was that uh, over North Coast? Uh, no, four days later. It was a, I was the last, last person ever to land the Lightning here. It was the Thursday afternoon. Did they leave on the Friday? I can't remember. It was, I think it was the Thursday afternoon, three or four o'clock. I went over the Chris BP. We did 1v1 with a tanker up for about three hours. I came back and I decided... I'd, uh, the next morning, I'd said to John Spencer, right, 1v1 in the overhead, I want to take you on, boy, <laughs> being a big head. I thought, I'll go and take John Spawn on 1v1, which really is asking for it. And, uh, and I said, I'll fly with you, because they'd already decided that the aeroplanes would be delivered by John Aldington and uh, Paul Cooper. So the only other people left were myself and, and, and 
Rugby and uh, the Spawn. And I said, right, why don't we fly them both? We'll fly 1v1 in the overhead for the troops, and then the aeroplanes will land, we'll refuel them, and they'll go off. And I talked to him, he was a station commander at the time, so I talked him into it. So, uh, and he wanted to be the last person to land at Bimbrook. He said, I want to be the last person to land. So that was why we are going to do it. So we'd do the 1v1, I'd land, he'd land, they'd refuel, they'd then go, and he'd be the last one to ever land at Bimbrook. Yeah. What actually happened was I flew the previous afternoon with Chris Berners-Price. We came in, and just, I had to do Fred's farm. Fred isn't here today. But Fred's got a farm over there somewhere. Yeah. And Fred wanted to beat up at his farm. And on the way back to the airfield, oh shit, Fred's farm. And we looked at it on an Odin Survey map. I always just see him down the blacksmith's arms. So I had to find this farm building, which is the end of the downwind leg. I think it's that way, State and Lavelle way. And I, eventually I found him and I sort of uh, found this farm. Chris BP landed. I thought I'd better go and do Fred's farm. I didn't promise him. So I went and aimed straight at the farm. At this point, they were in the fields. Apparently, it was just tea break time. And I could see them all, so I just aimed straight at them. <laughs> aimed straight at them from the downwind leg. And this Fred goes, Woo, Porky! Ah! <laughs> Stuck the heaters in, right over the top, just tipped over and landed, you see. And I thought nothing of it. Landed here at about, I don't know, half past three, four o'clock. Did a little run over the crash gate out there. Broke the circuit, landed. Came in the next morning, expecting to fly. And John Spencer came and said, I've got a cold, Porky. Can't fly. So uh, that's it. He said, it's too difficult. If one of the aeroplanes go US or it all gets a bit out of, out of hand on the 1v1, it'd be very silly. Let's let them go. Let's just let them go. And I went, oh shit, I'm going to do a 1v1 against you. <laughs> he said, I know, but I've got a cold and I'm not flying and nor are you. And they're going, shut up. So that's what happened. And it suddenly occurred to me after they'd gone that I was the last person to land yeah. at Bimbrook. I landed the previous afternoon. I was the last one to land. All because of Fred's farm. <laughs> it could have been Chris BP, but it wasn't. But I did let him deliver the Brunting Thorpe aeroplane, so he got away with that. <laughs> He begged me to do that, so I was going to do it. He begged me, and he was really, really keen to do it. I said, "Well, you do do it." Then. He did it. So uh, keep going on about it ever since. <laughs> I just had to be writing the program for the day. And we had the delivery on. You know, we did. I mean, all the deliveries I did were for battle damage repair. And I delivered 754 to Honington, and they cut it up within a half an hour. My aeroplane got cut up. I mean, you know, all the ones I did it was cut up. Was lucky to decide which thing to say. He did. That was a good one to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah he did. He did it with John Aldington. Uh, I think he did it with John Aldington and I think Paul Cooper might have done it. But they, yeah, they tanked out. I think they took a pair, didn't they? They yeah, tanked took a out. Two, 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 five, they left it there. And that's apparently beautiful. I haven't seen it. Apparently it's beautiful. I've seen a picture of it. Yeah, I've seen it. So they, they did that. Yeah, that was a good one to do. I did, I did the fly pass for the Olverton one, but I didn't actually deliver the aeroplane. Jack Jaron took his yeah, aeroplane. Yeah, yeah, and I did the beta. That, yeah. But he actually took it. He took it in. That morning, I think the idea was that well, actually he might have come in after me. I don't know, but I, if you were there, I did the beat up. That was me. Um, he decided that he was too senior to go doing beat ups. So his career was worth too much. He said, "Would you go and do the beat up for me legally, of course, and I'll deliver the airplane off X spot." Yeah, very nice of you. Yeah, I'm going to get in the shit and all the noise complaints and everything. He's going to just drop in there and deliver it. So I did that. Um, he had to land it either side, he was telling me he had to land it either side of the tarmac, didn't he? That's probably right, I don't know, I didn't land yeah. I just went and beat it up and go over the museum and that stuff with the guys all there. Yeah, so the I came up on the base a few days after. Mm -hmm. so. There's still one at, uh, there's one at Coningsby, not Coningsby, there's one at uh, Leeming. 753's in Leeming. Yeah, they're keeping that though, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They, at one time they were going to bloody get rid of it and then it was, you know, a decoy. They come up with all reasons, but they've still got it. And I was really pleased. In fact, that aeroplane was when I joined 11 Squadron, that was the boss's aeroplane. That was Bravo Alpha. That was Doug Elwood's aeroplane. What's the condition? Well, it's outside. Last time I saw it, it was a long, long time ago. It was all right. Yeah, it was pretty good. They, were, they repainted it and they done stuff to it. It looked really good last time. Right. It, it always was camouflage. Yeah. The aeroplane always was camouflage. Yeah, it was Alpha on, it was Alpha on 11 Squadron. I joined the squadron, it was Doug Elwood's aeroplane, and then it was John Spencer's aeroplane, and then 728 came along. That's right, you took that. Yeah. yeah. But he and I kept the same aeroplane in different places, it was quite funny. You know, I was just very lucky that my aeroplane, 901, was on 11. Get the thing DIY. started, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said, right, you get the nitrogen bottles, and you take this bloody lead off, and you plug that in there, and you swap the bloody fuses over, and then you do this, then you get the hammer and bang it there, yeah. and then you run the nitrogen, and then you, you know, so he told yeah. us all this stuff, because yeah. we staged to Cyprus. And I'd heard about Chris Lawrence, Savage, and, and actually ended up somewhere where we didn't have ground crew support, yeah. with one running, yeah. everybody else in the formation's running except him, yeah. and they're all going to go without him. Yeah. And he actually climbed up the cockpit with one running, Shit. hang on, wait for it, and got the other one running. And we all, <laughs> and we heard the story back at Brimbrook, that's five squad, yeah. I was at 11. Yeah. And I thought, bloody hell, I don't believe he did that, yeah, holy yeah. shit. Yeah. And we all said, and when he got back, he said, did you do that? He said, yeah, I did. So, well, no choice. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to go without me. I'm in Brindisi. Yeah. We know ground crew support. I'm in the bloody nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been to Brindisi? No, it's no. the biggest shit hole on earth. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not staying there. So I went and did it, and it worked. I thought, he's bloody impressive, that. Yeah. Five years later, yeah. I'm at the air show at Neuburg. Yeah. We'd had a squadron exchange with the F4S from the Mulders at Neuburg. 
a really good bunch of pissheads, actually. Great guys. <laughs> and they said, come down, Forky, you must come to the air show. We have a great weekend. It will be great fun. Well, great. So they got John Aldington to go when he did the display. Yeah, so I got a tanker, because he's in a mark three, so I couldn't make it. So I raged the tanker, and we got a victor, and he took us right to the FR boundary of France, so a little Belgium actually. Yeah. We came right up to Coxie on the boundary, mm -hmm. we stopped on the boundary, we plugged up, we pulled up, I had the sick, I had my aeroplane actually. Mm -hmm. no, I insisted on taking my own aeroplane. Yep. Uh, great, good idea, Al. Yeah. So I took 901 and off we went. We got to the boundary, they left us, we flew to Neuburg, we landed, <coughs> we had a great weekend, PJ did his display, bloody fantastic display as it always was, second year he did it and it was a brilliant display, I got pissed, fell over, left the airplane on static, sold loads of prints and zaps like I do, had a good time, came out Monday morning with the bloody thing start, what it hell, I'm in Germany, I have even got the RF exchange zone the German air, in the Munich, eight miles in Munich, an aeroplane won't start. I got one running, and I couldn't get another running. Not only that, but we didn't have F-34, which is our fuel. We had F-40, which has got a lower specific gravity. It's crap fuel. It's the NATO right. fuel, which means you carry about six or 800 pounds less. Neuburg is 650 miles from Limburg, yeah. which is about 6,500 pounds of fuel. Yeah. So it's sporty at the best of times. Yeah. We wanted to go by a Bruggen or Gordon yeah. and BJ had to in the Mark III. And, and eventually, I couldn't get the other run, the number two running, so I shut it down. I had six six starts because I topped up the earth pin tank at Bimbra, which we weren't allowed to do. Right. So they topped it up hot with it running. So at least I had six starts. I'd used one. <laughs> Went into the lineup, said, right, I've got a phone Bimbra. It took me about half an hour to get through. Talked to the engineers, right, boys, yeah. give it to me straight. And I go, get the start, yeah. So, right, take off the bloody lead, you know, sort the starter leads over. Try that first. Yeah. I'll try the fuses, then the lead, yeah. then try to take off the pipe to the air motor, blow some nitrogen oh. through, yeah. then this, then that side. So I got in, had, had another go, wouldn't start. Yeah. I went back and said, right, there's one last thing. Did you hit the hammer in that place? Yeah, I hit the hammer. Yeah. So get the ground crew. So I got this ground crew in German, didn't speak English, yeah. up on the wing. Yeah. I said, there's the point. I said, they're right on that point, that box yeah. there. You're going to get that hammer. When I go now, yeah. you go, bop, 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 yeah. He did it, didn't work. Yeah. Maybe with one option. Yeah. So I thought, OK, I have one shot left. If I didn't get this going, they're going to have to fly out spares and ground crew in the T5 from the UK. Double hot. Oh, horrendous. So I got in, I got sockets. I got the number one going. I got this all or nothing. I've yeah. got the number one going, I've got my handkerchief out, tied it around the parking brake, yeah. really tight, yeah. climbed out the ladder, on the wing, open the aft pin hatch, so the end, one engine's running, I'm chopped. One engine's running, swapped over the nitrogen, it blew through the nitrogen, did the whole lot, blew the nitrogen, yeah. swapped the fuses, swapped the starter boxes, did it all up, so I couldn't do it without it, yeah. shut it down, yeah. all back up, turned round, and all the other guys had done the static display, the ground crew, yeah. the pilots, the F-16 drivers, the Air Force, yeah. and they're all around in a huge room. <laughs> the aeroplane with cameras on. Oh shit! Yeah. <laughs> cameras of me no, up there with the engine no, running. No. Yeah. Climbed in and it went. Yeah. And I looked at the fuel. Thought, shit, I'm gonna make it home. Yeah. Just made it. Yeah. Just got everyone. It's the first I've ever flown a Lightning unrefueled, 650 miles yeah. in the Mark Six. And uh, we got back. Just. But you know, the good thing was at least if I didn't quite pay, I could lob into Watershed on the way back. Sure. I had to go to somewhere where there's Lightning experienced guys. Yeah. 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 So uh, it wasn't the end of the world. But I mean. Oh, I think that, I mean, it's quite, I haven't got a picture of it. It's like quite a lot of these things. You haven't got a photograph. I'd love to see a photograph of it. I'm sure there's a lot of people with photographs of it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, bloody funny. We'll do that story for the next review, mate. Uh, and we'll yeah. ask for a photograph. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, for a photograph. <coughs> yeah. No, it would have to be a German. It would have to be one of the German ground crew. The guys at the air show were taking pictures. You know, there'd be nobody English there, because it was Munich for the <laughs> Thanks.